Amen. Well, again, this morning, we want to thank you for joining us. We're so glad that you're here with us. Uh, hopefully, you have uh, your Easter Sunday all planned out. Uh, it's, a, it's a great, great day. Let's open up with a word of prayer before we get into the message this morning. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be together. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship and to praise you. We thank you for your gift. But more than anything, Father, we thank you that we can just worship you in spirit and in truth. We know the faithfulness of your word and the faithfulness of your love. And I pray that we would just continue to be moved by that daily. So, Father, we pray that you would bless our time together, bless the word, bless our lives. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I'm not sure why you came to church today. Uh, Maybe this is where you go to church on a regular basis. Uh, Maybe, like you said, you were driving by and you saw the building. You said, hey, we get people every week. They just said, I was just driving by and I stopped in for some reason. We know that that's the Holy Spirit prompting you to come in. Maybe you came because grandma invited you or mom invited you. Maybe you came because that's what you do. On Easter Sunday, you go to church. That's what you do. You might not go to church regularly, but you know that on Christmas and Easter, you go to church. I don't really, I don't really uh, care why you're here. That's funny, kind of funny for a pastor to say. <laughs> but I want you to understand, I'm just happy that you're here. I'm thankful that you made the decision to come this morning. Because I know that God has a beautiful appointment with you. It's a divine appointment. God wants you here. Whether this is the 300th time you've been here or the first time that you've been here. God wants you to be here. And I'm glad you made the choice to be here. I'm glad you made that decision. You know, choices are a funny thing. Choices are a funny thing. We make hundreds of choices a day. We make, make hundreds of choices. Some of them we're aware of. And, and some of them we aren't. So, like, we go to Starbucks. What kind of coffee do I want? Or around here, it's more Dunkin' Donuts, isn't it? Getting decided. Now, I'm not from New Jersey. Wa- oh, I'm sorry. Wawa. Oh, my goodness. Wawa. Thanks. You let me, sw- you let me slide. Listen, I'm, I, I, I've, I've, spent, you know, I've been in New Jersey for a year now. And, uh, you know, it's been a good, it's been a good, uh, adjustment, right? I, I, I'm enjoying it. But let me tell you, I am still struggling with the difficulty of getting to Starbucks, okay? Because the, the jug handles, I will do everything I can to avoid that. And, but coming from Virginia, so we were in Virginia for seven and a half years, getting to Starbucks was easy because they were all over the place. Uh, in Ohio, where we're from in Ohio, getting to Starbucks is a little harder, uh, but they're, they're, they're starting to expand. But I think Wawa and Dunkin' Donuts are going to pretty well run Starbucks out of the market here in Ocean and Monmouth County. So, I, but when we go there, we have to decide what, Wawa's got like 17 different kinds of coffee, don't they? You got to decide, and then they got 19 different kinds of creamer. You got to decide what you want on that. So we have to make decisions, don't we? We have to decide what kind of shirt we're going to wear. How many of you are enjoying? How many? So now it's interesting. Interesting. Uh, we we did our big. You know, we wanted to invite our peeps to church for Easter, and that's why we say welcome peeps. Uh, and I went with Team Purple, uh, and it's not because I like Pastor Yvonne more than Pastor Joe. I've got it. I've got a green one in my office, but this is what Heather ordered for me, and therefore that is what I am wearing. But it seems like most of the guys went went green. And most, most of the ladies went purple. I was happy to see that Wendell went with purple. Yeah, because, yeah, so. But we make choices every day. Some we're aware of, some we're not. You know, what kind of coffee do I want? What kind of shirt am I going to wear? Which direction do I brush my teeth today? We probably don't. What way do I drive to work? Which way is going to get the most traffic? A lot of our choices are automatic. We don't actually consciously decide whether we're going to blink or breathe. It just happens. Those are automatic decisions. And, you know, other choices we spend a lot of time on. What color are we going to paint the living room again? (sighs) Where do I want to go to college? Who should I marry? Some of these choices should take a long time. And then some of the choices are made for us. The family we're born into. Color of our skin. Some choices we don't have any decision in. 
Some choices, uh, we just kind of, we leave them up in the air for a later date. What are we going to do this weekend? What TV show will I watch tonight? Heather and I were talking about what we're going to do on Monday since uh, we have the day off. And we were talking about it on Thursday. And Heather goes, we can decide that later. Some choices we can just put off because they're not that important. Now, I don't think, for church folks, I don't think any decision is more difficult than where you're going to go to lunch after church on Sundays. Right? Right? It, 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 for some people, that conversation starts on Saturday. Where are we going to lunch tomorrow? Now, my family's a little different than Heather's family. Uh, my family, we are quick on decisions. We are. We're, we, and so the first person that says, this is where I want to go to lunch, it doesn't care if no one else in the group, it doesn't matter if no one else in the group likes it or not, that's where we're going because they were the first one to make a decision. And there's many times we went to places that no one else wanted to go in my family. Heather's family, on the other hand, making the decision is much like deciding to go to the dentist. They put it off as long as they possibly can. So when I came onto the scene, we, I realized after several weeks that we were always going to um, lunch where I wanted to go. And I realized that they played the game a little differently than my family. My family, you get it out there quick. Their family, I don't know, 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 until they come to a consensus. It's the, it's the Norwegian in them. Uh, they, they, the Norwegians are very, very polite. And so it's the German in me that says, we're going here. <laughs> so I had to adopt a different method of uh, lunch selection. What I had to do is actually start letting them all have the opportunity to say, I don't know, before I said, this is where we're going to lunch. I still get to make the decision, but at least I was polite enough. You know, I hope after church today you guys already have lunch plans lined up because I don't want to see fighting on Easter Sunday, okay? It's a hard thing to make decisions, isn't it? Choices are funny, but they're important. They're really, really important because certain choices affect our lives forever. Some decisions that we're going to make, they, they're, they're going to make a long-term impact. You know, choices are a lot like walking through a door. You made the decision to come to church today. You walked through a door. You walked through at your house, got in your car. Here you are. How many of you remember Let's Make a Deal? That TV show? The TV show? Door one, two, or three, which one were you going to select? Which one are you going to choose? Now, I bet a lot of you watched it and you hoped they picked the wrong door, Right? Because they're just hilarious what they were going to do. What they got, you know, you want a muddy pig. You're like, what am I going to do with that? Making the wrong choice on let's make a deal can be pretty funny. But making the wrong choice in our life, picking the wrong door, we very rarely want to make the wrong decision, do we? You know, and today we're celebrating Easter. Easter really is a celebration. It is a celebration. It's intended to be a celebration because of Jesus' resurrection. Jesus' death was one of the most significant, not even one of, it was the most significant event in human history. His victory over death and the grave, which is what we're celebrating today, changed the course of time. The resurrection was necessary as we said during communion, because of our sin. Because of the thing that separated us from Jesus. That separated us from God. And Jesus made a sacrifice on a cross for you and me. He's buried. He died. And he was resurrected on Easter Sunday. That's why we celebrate. That's why we celebrate. Because his death made it possible for me to have a relationship with God. But here's the beautiful thing about Jesus' death. Jesus' death on the cross was by his choice. He decided to do it. It was a choice that was made for you and me. But it wasn't really a single choice. Jesus' death on the cross was actually a series of choices. And it was a series of choices to help God's children Be in relationship with him. How many of you are parents in here? 
How many of you have ever had to fix a bad choice of your children? Your kids make bad choices sometimes, and sometimes you make a bad choice as a parent, don't you? It's hard. I remember when I was a kid, me and my, I don't know if my sister's watching, uh, she said she was going to watch, she lives in Florida, if you are, hi. Uh, We were uh, kids, me, my brother, my sister, my brother's three years older than me, my sister's three years younger than me. I was, as I was talking about the message, I was remembering a bad choice that me and my brother and Paul Berkston made. Um, I'm really blaming Paul. Because uh, I was the youngest in the group, uh, but a house was under construction in our neighborhood, and so we decided to see um, how well our ninja skills could test the construction of the house. Now, depending on your perspective, this was a good or a bad thing. But one of the neighbors saw us, and they called the cops. And so, me and my brother and Paul Berkston, we we took off on our bikes through the neighborhood, and we, we got away. We, we made it away from the cops. It was great. The only thing is we forgot. Yeah, well, listen, we were doing something wrong. I know, you shouldn't do it, but we forgot my sister. <laughs> and so the cops came back. They said, do you know those boys? And she's like, yeah, they're my brothers. <laughs> we made a bad choice. And that bad choice ended up costing my parents something. Actually, it ended up costing us something uh, because we had to pay for the damage, which unfortunately uh, was a lot more than a nine-year-old makes uh, in a given week. You know, our choices, they define our lives, don't they? That one was, you know, one you can laugh about now. I didn't laugh about it at the time. It wasn't funny then. My parents had to come and rescue me from my bad choice. Easter is that celebration of the choice that God made. And perhaps you're familiar with the story of Easter. I don't know. You know, here's the interesting thing. It used to be that you could assume everybody that came to church knew what the Bible said. You know, I've been in church my whole life. I'm 42 years old. Uh, I was born in the second pew. You know, not really, but... I, I. I have to clarify that sometimes people don't pick up on the sarcasm, and I don't want people really thinking I was born in church. I mean, we were committed, but not quite that committed. We were, I was in a hospital, okay? But we, we, I've been in church my whole life, and you know, I grew up in the Bible Belt. I grew up in Ohio. So you could always assume that people knew everything. I don't think you can assume that anymore. Maybe you're here today because you saw an advertisement on Facebook. Maybe you're here today because somebody passed you out an invite card and you were curious. So I don't want to assume anything. And so to understand the depth of the choice that Jesus made on Easter, I really think that we need to uh, give a quick recap of uh, how we ended up at Easter. In the book of Genesis, uh, we find Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were created... By God. And the day, in the book of Genesis is creation. And so we'll, we'll be in the garden here. We'll be in the garden of, of, of choices. And God created everything. He, he, invite, he created earth, plants, animals, men, and women. And he created men, created man and woman, to be in relationship with each other and to be in relationship with him. And they were created pure and perfect. There was nothing wrong with them. Nothing wrong with them. But then an angel named Lucifer came and deceived Adam and Eve. God had put Adam and Eve in the the garden and said, you can eat from any of the fruits of the trees. You can do anything that you want. Just don't eat from that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But then Lucifer came and said, did God really say Don't eat from that tree. Do you know why God said that? It's because he doesn't want you to know as much as he knows. There's nothing really bad going to happen to you. Now, a lot of people, we see this picture of Adam and Eve talking to a serpent. And they see Eve eating an apple and offering it to Adam. We don't actually know what kind of fruit. We don't know that. It's not an important detail. But what we know is that Lucifer was essentially asking Adam and Eve when he said, did God really say 
not to do that? He was really asking them to make a choice. Do you believe what God said? Or do you not believe what God said? And here's the real interesting question. Why? After walking with God every day, which is what they did in the garden, they walked openly with God. Why, after walking with God in the Garden of Eden, would they jeopardize that? Why? I don't know that we have the why, but I can tell you the how. They were able to do that because God made us so that we could make a choice. God gave us free will. God could have made it so that we didn't have any choice. God could have made it so that we had no say in the decision. But that's not what God did. You might wonder why we're talking about creation during Easter. Well, there's a couple things I want us to really understand. That's why we went all the way back to the beginning. I want us to understand this. And they've been part of the human existence from the very beginning. The first thing is that God wants to be in a relationship with you. That's the first thing I want you to understand. And the second thing I want us to understand is that we have a choice of whether it happens or not. God's not going to make you be in a relationship with him. Now, I'm pretty sure we know how Adam and Eve chose. They both decided to eat the fruit of that tree and disobeyed God's command. And when they did that, sin entered the world. Sin came into the world. What sin? Well, sin is a behavior or a decision or a choice that we make that goes counter to what God desires for our life, and it separates us from him. So why let us choose? Why let us make a decision? Wouldn't it have just been easier to not let us make the decision? Well, remember that first thing, that God wants to be in a relationship with us. But even more than that, God wants us to want to be in a relationship with him. Worship that is forced is not genuine worship. A relationship that is demanded is not a genuine relationship. God wants a true relationship with you. You know, if you look at the rest of the Old Testament, it's really about God's desire to be with his people. If you see the example, now there's all sorts of great lessons in the Old Testament, and it's a powerful, uh, just powerful lessons. But the biggest lesson that we can take from the Old Testament is this, is that God chases his people. God pursues his people. He gave them opportunity time and time again to be in relationship with him because he wants to be with us. From, from, from looking at all of the different choices that he made, God pursued people. From selecting David to be king, David, the most unlikely candidate in his family, he picked him to be the king. From, from, selecting, from telling Hosea to marry Gomer, a prostitute, from to telling his, pro, his prophet to marry a prostitute to show his great love for people. God, throughout the Old Testament, tried to demonstrate his love for people and his desire to be with them. And in the Old Testament, here's what we see. And we still see it today. Sometimes people choose him and sometimes they don't. Sometimes we make the choice to be with God and sometimes we make the choice to satisfy ourselves. Our decisions impact our lives. Do I take the safe and reliable job or do I go for the less secure but more exciting one? Do I tell the truth and admit my mistake or do I lie and look like the hero? Do I remain faithful to my spouse or do I satisfy my own desires? Every day we are faced with choices. And those choices do one of two things. They either bring us closer to God or take us further away. And understand it's our choice God continues 
to want to help us in our choice. That's how we end up at Easter today. That's how we end up to Easter Day. John 3.16, probably the most famous verse in the entire Bible because the NFL has helped us get it out there. Here's the summation of what it says, right? You're probably familiar with it. For God so loved the world that he, this is my paraphrase, that he chose to send his one and only son to give people the chance to be in relationship with him. God chose us. If you're familiar with the story of Jesus in the Gospels, then you know that the result of Jesus coming to walk with the people was much like Jesus's, much like God's pursuit of his people in the Old Testament. He offered it, and some people took it, and some people didn't. You know, it's, it's an interesting part of the Easter story that sometimes we overlook. That sometimes we just read through real quick. And uh, kind of forget. Jesus actually asked God, don't make me do this. Don't make me do this. Matthew 26, 39. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. He was literally saying, if I don't have to do this, please don't make me do it. But he concluded that prayer. He said, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus had to make a choice. We don't think of it in that term sometimes, do we? But Jesus had to make a choice. The details of Jesus' crucifixion on the cross, is, it's really a series of choices that he made. Because of his desire to be close to God and to make a way for you and I to be close to God as well, he made choices. The father didn't take the cup from Jesus, but Jesus didn't flee, did he? He proceeded onward. Later, when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus and Peter cut off the ear of the guard in an attempt to protect Jesus, Jesus did not run away. Rather, he reminds everyone, if I chose to, I could call down 12 legions of angels to protect myself if I choose. But this is how things have to happen to make a way for you. That's what Jesus said. In front of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council for the Jewish community, he chose not to defend himself. In front of Pontius Pilate, he didn't deny anything. Pilate's an interesting example of choices because Pilate wasn't really willing to make the choice himself. At the end of deciding to send Jesus for his execution, what did Pontius Pilate do? He washed his hands to wash his hands of that choice. Pilate stood in front of the people and said, what do you want me to do with this man? Should I give you the one who I can find no fault with or should I give you the murderer? And the people chose for Pontius Pilate. They said, give us Barabbas. We know that he's bad. But crucify Jesus. A lot of times we're like Pilate. We let other people make the choice for us. But the choice was made, wasn't it? On the cross itself, Jesus didn't resist. It's why they said he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He didn't fight. He didn't ask for mercy. And on that cross, Jesus was not, get, was not done giving people the opportunity to make a choice. We know in the Word of God that as he was there, Luke chapter 23, verse 43, one of the criminals that was being crucified next to Jesus Ask Jesus to remember him. And Jesus answered him. It says, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. At the very end of the man's life, being crucified as a criminal, Jesus offers hope. Essentially, what he says is, as long as you're breathing, your choices can be forgiven. And you can be restored in your relationship 
with God. Jesus made a choice to die on the cross that day. And when he did, he made it possible for our lives to be changed. Because three days after he died on the cross, he rose from the dead. And he removed sin from our lives. If we make the decision, after his death and resurrection, those things that separated us from God, the sin that we have allowed to break the original relationship with God in the garden, all of those things can be forgiven. All of those things can be changed. Today you might be sitting here and say, Pastor Spencer, I don't go to church. This is the first time I've been in a church in a year, two years, ten years. And you say, Pastor Spencer, you don't know what I've done. And you're right, I don't. And I don't need to. Jesus knows. Jesus knows. Before he died, Jesus told one of his closest disciples, Peter, that Peter would deny Jesus. Maybe you're familiar with the story. What did Peter say? No, Lord, I love you more than anyone else loves you. I will never deny you. Now, this is somebody that had walked with Jesus for several years, had seen miracles, had walked on water. Jesus tells him, you're going to deny me. You're going to abandon me. Peter says, no, it's never going to happen. After Jesus was crucified on the cross, Peter did three times cussing at people, swearing at people. I don't know the man. I don't know him. Imagine where that puts Peter. He just denied his mentor, his teacher, the Savior of the world, because he recognized that Jesus was the Son of God. He just denied him. Imagine how that damages a relationship. Imagine what that does to your heart to betray somebody that has shown you absolute love. And we would often think, because we think in the terms of humans, we would often think that that means that relationship was done forever. Because I know if somebody did that to me, I would have a hard time trusting them again. I know if somebody did that to me, I would have a hard time forgiving them again. But after his resurrection, Jesus went to Peter, the disciple who abandoned him. Abandoned him to save his own skin and because it was convenient. And gave him the opportunity to make the right choice. Jesus went to him and it says in the book of John chapter 21, Peter, Jesus talking to Peter, he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes, Lord, you know I do. Jesus looked at him and said, then feed my sheep. He said, it doesn't matter that you denied me because if you make the choice to believe in me, your sin." will be forgiven. Today you may be sitting here and say, yeah, that's great in the Bible. They made all the right choices. Read the Bible. They did not make all the right choices. The, the people in the Bible made choice, the wrong choices left and right. It doesn't wrap up all nice and neat in the end for everybody in the Bible. And sometimes we think about it and we go, what about real life, not just the Bible? Well, I want to tell you the Bible is not a fairy tale. The Bible is not just a collection of myth and fables. It's the story of God's love and his pursuit of redeeming the world. That is the story of the Bible. It's not a collection of fictional stories. It's stories about real people. It's a testimony of God's love. The story of the Bible isn't really about the people in the Bible. It's about God's love for those people and about God's love for you and me. 
And I know that the God of Adam and Eve and the God of the Old Testament who pursued his people throughout history and the Savior of Peter and the disciples is still saving people today. I know it because of my own life. I know it because I know the Savior. But even better than that, I know it because I know the people that he is still saving today.